If you have your Bibles, you can turn, you can go ahead and find the scripture. It's in 1 Chronicles chapter number 19. 1 Chronicles chapter number 19. We're not going to put it up there yet. Hope not, not yet. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Turn, turn that thing off. You, could, you wouldn't understand what I was preaching about even if you read the story because it's only in my mind. Uh, and you'll see um, that God speaks to me in different things. And when I read different stories, there's different things about the story that I've heard. Sometimes you hear the story hundreds of times and sometimes you hear it for the first time and things jump off at you differently. It does me. Um, so you just have to bear with it and, uh, and get the truth that, that God's got for you this morning because that's what I want to give you. Let's open word with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you today for the opportunity to hear your word. God, that you have a word for us today right here. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would help me to, to, to do my best to give, it, to give it all that I can. But God, not my words or my thoughts. God, let it be yours. God, that I surrender this message and this time to you that you would be honored and you would be lifted up, that your people would be challenged by your words. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I, don't know that, I don't know if you got spankings when you were a kid. So I can't speak to your childhood. I can't speak to your childhood. We got spankings in my house. My parents, they, lit, they took that scripture literally. Spare the rod, spoil the child. They're like, nobody's getting out of spoil, so they all, because there was no sparing going on. Sometimes I felt like sparring, but there was no sparing. Anyways, my kids, my, my parents believed in spanking, and we have passed that on down to generations in my home. We believe in whooping. Not beating, but whooping. We, you get a whooping in my house. Uh, and if, you, my, if you're my kids' friends and you're visiting, you might get a whooping. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I see a couple of my, my, my kids' friends right now. They got nervous. Started squirming. It's all right. You're safe. You're safe right now. Um, but we did. We got spankings. And, and sometimes, and I would love to be, I would love to stand up here as a grown man and square my shoulders back and, told, and tell you that I took those whoopings like a man. I did not. I did not. In fact, if we're going to be, I'm, we're just going to be transparent this morning, be honest with you, tell you stuff that you don't really have to know about me, but I'm just going to let you know, it is it's what it is. And maybe you'll look at me differently after this and you don't, don't let it, don't, hope you don't lose too much respect. But when I was a kid, I didn't want to take a spanking, right? And so my dad would be like, you got it. And since I was the firstborn, um, I got a lot of spanking. Sometimes they didn't know who, who did it. I got the blame for it. I caught the rap. And my parents were like, hey, you getting a spanking? I'm like, no. Well, then I felt like that was negotiation times. You know what I'm saying? So my, my dad would be like, you got three licks? And I'd be like, well, you don't understand what happened. That's why you want to whip me. If you understood what happened, you would, you would whip the other children because it was their fault probably. Even if it was my fault, I was thinking in my head, how can I get out of this? And so it was negotiation time. So my dad would like, he would come in a room and uh, he had a, a very checkered past, uh, and he had some, some things that happened in his childhood that he was, was very defensive and made sure that he didn't pass along to us. And uh, so I thank you for that. But in the process, everything got explained out. And so we, this, this whooping process took a while. My dad would come in. He would tell us where we were getting a spanking for. Then we would, he would cry and tell us he didn't want to spank us. And I'd be like, well, man, you don't have to. It's okay. It's okay, baby. It's, it's okay. I don't want to do that to you, man. I love you. I don't wanna, take, I'll take one for the team. You ain't got to spank me today. Benjamin tomorrow, Joy tomorrow, yes. But me, no. Let's, so I would go in negotiations with my dad. I'd be like, let me just tell you one thing. That was my famous. Let me just tell you one thing. And he'd be like, he'd be like, okay. And he would, he would, he gave, I mean, he gave me a chance. I don't know why, but he gave me a chance. And I would go in and tell him this, I would sp start spinning my story. And I'm spinning my story and I'm telling him what all I, and he's like, okay, okay. And I'm like, I got him. He's, on, he's with me. He's with me. He's like, you still got three licks. I'm like, no. And I said, this one thing, and you don't understand. He's like, if you say another word, you get four licks. And I'm like, but daddy. He's like, no, you got four. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not, now you got five. But no, no. You see how, you see how that works? You, you see, I keep digging the ditch, and I start digging my hole, and I can't stop digging, and I'm at the bottom. And there was one particular time where he's like, if you say another word, you'll get a spanking, and uh, you're going to add licks. And I got to, I'm not going to tell you how many, because you'll think it's child abuse. And it was, and it was my own fault, because I just, 
I felt like at some point there's just no return. I might as well dig to the bottom and hope that I reach the top on the other side. And so I just kept. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been in a situation where you think there's, all I can do is dig out to the other side because there's no going back? And I just keep digging. And I could hear the voice in my head when I got past like lick number 10. And the voice in my head was like, stop. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> I think it was coming from my behind because that was, that's who's going to pay the price. Stop. Stop digging. Stop digging. There's a story in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles. And I'm gonna, I'll read it to you. 1 Chronicles chapter number 19. Chapter 19, starting in verse 1, says, Sometime after this, King Nashash of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanan became king. David said, I'm going to show loyalty to Hanan because his father Nashash was always loyal to me. So David sent messengers to express sympathy to Hanan about his father's death. But when David's ambassadors arrived in the land of Ammon, the Ammonite commander said to Hanan, do you really think these men are coming here to honor your father? No. David has sent them to spy out the land so they could come and conquer it. So Hanan seized David's ambassadors, shaved them, cut off their robes at the buttocks. That's what it says in the Bible. Just reading the word of God. And sent them back to David in shame. Shaved their beards and cut off their robes at the rear end and sent them back in shame. When David heard what happened to the men, he sent messages to tell them, stay in Jericho until your beards grow out, and then you can come back. For they felt deep shame because of their appearance. I fear they can put on a new robe, but you can't grow facial hair that quick. Only Shannon grows facial hair like overnight, that quick. When the people of Ammon realized how seriously they had angered David, Hanan and the Ammonites Haman, Haman and the Ammonites sent 75,000 pounds of silver to hire chariots and charioteers from Aram Nereham and Aram Mechah and Zoab. They also hired 32,000 chariots and secured the support of the king and his army. Now, as I'm reading this story and I'm thinking to myself, this guy has embarrassed these ambassadors, David's ambassadors. He's, they've, he's, he's se severely embarrassed them. He shaved off their face. He cut their robes and sent them back in shame. And when he realized that he had made a mistake, at that moment, I, I, I thought as I read the story, I thought he, there was another option. There was another option besides war. But in order to take the other option, you have to stop digging. When you realize that you've made a mistake and you've, made, you've done a, a, a horrible blunder and you've, you've made an idiot of yourself, there is another opportunity for you besides going to war and continuing to dig your hole. There's another option. And as I read it, I thought, what if, what if this king who, who severely dissed all of Caleb's, all of, all of David's men, what if instead of hiring other soldiers and charioteers, what if instead of aligning other nations for war, what if he apologized? What if he took that same 75,000 pounds of silver and sent it to those three men and said, my bad. <laughs> what if instead of digging his heels in and declaring war, and costing not only his, his nation hundreds and thousands of men to die in battle. What if he was like, I'm sorry. What if he decided instead of causing war, he decided to apologize and stop digging. See, it's easier sometimes when our heels are dug in and we feel like we've done something so unforgivable. It's easy for us to continue to just dig our hole deeper. To dig in and go, you know what, I am right. It doesn't matter what you think. I am right. This was a legitimate idea. This was a, my, my, my army advisor. He's the one who told me. It's easy for us to dig in than to apologize. 
than to own our part of it, even if it wasn't Hanan's, all of Hanan's fault. As Christians, sometimes we get so caught up in being right that we forget that God doesn't care about being right or wrong in an argument, right? That's, that's not the most important thing to him. Righteousness is the most important thing to him. Forgiveness is the more important thing to him. And so in the middle of this, I'm digging my heels in. My kids, there's times, I'm going to blow you away right now. There's times I, I overreact to the situation that I'm in. And I have a choice as their dad that I can just say nothing or I can own it. I can own my part of the, of the situation that's gone south. Whatever they've done wrong, maybe it doesn't deserve quite the punishment that I was dealing out. Or maybe it doesn't deserve quite the berating that I gave them. It's my choice, it's my decision as a parent at that point to just let them be hurt or to own my own part of that. And apologize. And say, man, I'm sorry. And my kids can tell you, there's a lot of times in my house where I've got to go to their room with egg on my face. Because I've done something that's less than Christ-like. And I've got to do something, and I've got to make a decision to be more than Christ-like. To be Christ-like. I've got to go to the room and say, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my overreacting. Forgive me for whatever I've done. Even though I'm the parent, and there's, not, there's no rule book that says I have to apologize. Now, for my kids, they got to apologize. They better say I'm sorry. To each other. Like, we teach them that. We teach them to say I'm sorry to each other. My little girl one time, she was, she was like two, and we're all on the couch together, and she kicks Luke square in the face. I mean, to the point where he's like crying. He's like, oh, I mean, he kicks him on the eye. And she's old enough. Like, she's at the point she's over two. She knows better. You remember this? And I was like, you got to apologize to Luke. Son, she was like, she went stone cold killer on me. I was like, you got to apologize to your brother. And she's like, I mean, there was no facial expression. There was no sympathy. There was no, I'm sorry, my bad. There was nothing. It took, well, we spent like 30 minutes. I popped her hand. I mean, I did anything I could think of. She, and finally, like it took over 30 minutes. And finally she's like, I'm sorry. I was like, dang. She's a killer. She's savage. Y'all don't mess with your sister. You're bigger than her right now, but she's way meaner. But how many times when we're wrong, do we dig our heels in? Do we dig our heels in and decide, I'm just going to dig this thing out till I get to the other side? And the whole time, we're sit, we're, we know what we're doing is wrong, and we just keep digging. And we're at the bottom of this deep hole, and we're like, I could come up, I could ask for forgiveness, I could do this a different way, but I'm just going to keep digging. I'm just going to keep, because eventually i got to find sunlight somewhere. As people of God, we, 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 take, we take this pride in, in forgiving others, and sometimes, sometimes so we have to ask for forgiveness ourselves. And I think about the idea, like, in this story, like who, because other part of this is, who are you letting speak into your life? There's this army general who instead of telling him, yeah, David was great friends with your dad. Your dad was a great ally to King David. He probably is coming to show honor to your father. Instead of that, he gets, now he's coming to spy out the land. He wants to conquer you. Be careful who you let speak into your life. Just because they're close to you doesn't mean they're right for you. Just because they're close to you doesn't mean they're right for you. Be careful who you let speak into your life and give you advice. We were laughing before service. I don't let Ethan give me marital advice. You know why? Because he's single. Every single guy knows exactly how they're going to act if they get married. No, I don't take, I don't, 
We don't take advice from people that we can see, but we have to be looking for it. I have to be willing to look at the people that I surround myself with. Am I willing to listen to what they're speaking into me? Are they spiritually mature enough to be the, the, a, a voice in my life to help me? I mean, it sounds right. David sending people, my dad just died. It sounds right, but is it right? That's where as men and women of God, we have to have a, a, a spirit of discernment. That when we hear something, we have to weigh it against what we know to be true. Before we go and act, before you go shaving people's beards and cutting people's robes at the buttocks. We have to know, is this the voice of God in my life? Because if it's not, then all we're doing is just digging it deeper. And we just keep digging it deeper. And I feel like the Lord sometimes looks at us as we're digging these ditches for ourselves. And he's just like, stop digging. Just stop. Get out of your own way. Take for one minute a break and see that there is another option. There is another way that is better than this. That you don't have to dig your heels in. But the truth is it takes, it takes us putting down our pride. And we can talk about how we don't have an issue with pride until it comes to owning it and apologizing and wearing the egg on our face and being wrong. I kid my, I, I joke with my kids all the time. I, was, I tell them it's tough being right all the time. I'm like, you think it's easy? Look, I make it look easy. The cross that I bear. But the truth is this, I'm wrong, I'm wrong a lot. But I have to be willing to admit it. I have to be willing to own it. As a man of God, as a woman of God, you, we have to be willing to admit when we're wrong and own it and stop digging the ditches deeper. Stop digging our hole deeper for ourselves because the truth is, is we're not the only ones who are hurt there. When we read the story and we read that hundreds of men were killed in these battles, we just, we just kind of gloss over it. We forget that every one of those men had a wife and had children and had families and had a mother and a father. And although it seems like numbers on a page to us, it's lives that are forever changed by one man's decision to dig deeper. Are we allowing our decisions to be hard-headed and stubborn to not only affect our own lives, but to affect the lives of the people around us? Like, what are the casualties that we're willing to have in our lives for being right? What's the price that we're willing to pay? Because the whole time I'm thinking, man, if you would have just sent that money to those guys, if you would have sent, I mean, maybe even the head of that advisor, you know, here's the guy who got it wrong, David. We apologize. He more than I. <laughs> We apologize. Here's a whole bunch of, here's a truckload of silver. Please tell those guys we are very sorry. What happens? What happens there if a king decides to own his mistake? But because he's the king, he feels like, I can't be wrong. I got to dig my heels in. I'll hire, I'll hire armies from faraway lands to come and ally with me so that we can defeat someone who's not even an enemy. Someone who was a friend. And I read that story and I think, man, how many times have I done that in my own life? That I've made people feel isolated. That I've made, that I've made someone who could have been an ally, a friend, into something less because of my own pride. Because instead of being more like Christ, I want to be more like right. And I like to be right. Ask my wife. I like to be right. I do not like to lose. When we, we have a disagreement, I like to make sure that my point it comes across clearly so that not only she understands that I'm right, but I also hear how right I am as I'm. And there's times, again, just like when I was getting whooped as a kid, I, I hear myself, shut up. Shut up. Your dick, your soul is so deep. We're never going to get out. I just keep digging. 
because my pride won't let me be wrong. And I'm telling you today, stop digging. Some of you have dug holes for yourself and you feel like there's no way out. There is a way out. But it's going to take swallowing your pride. It's going to take putting down the, the person that you think you are. And it's going to be owning your part of it. I can't apologize for somebody else, but I can own my part. I can own my part of an argument with my kids, my wife, the people in my office. If me and Ethan have a disagreement, I can't, I can't apologize for Ethan being wrong. Because he's wrong a lot. But I can apologize for my part of it and say, man, I'm sorry. I was, I, I'm sorry for this part. You know what I'm saying? I'm his boss. What does that look like? I, in my head, what does it look like for me? I'm the, I'm the, it looks like that, that I'm still answer to him because we're still brothers in Christ. That, that's, still my, that's still my spiritual son. So I apologize to him. When I do something wrong, I, we, I, that's because that's what we do. Because I, wanted, I don't want to just be the only one doing it. I want to mirror it for my kids one day. When they get in situations that they can apologize, they can own their mistakes, they don't feel like I've got to just keep digging deeper to get out. But they feel like I can stop digging. It's okay to be wrong. What's not okay is for me to, to, to be unable to admit it. There's some, and we just, we just keep digging and digging. And you get to the bottom and you're like, what have you accomplished? I mean, when I, when, men, you all know this. Everybody, every man here knows. You want to argue with your wife, what do you get? Nothing. There's no prize. You get to be right. Guess who gets to know it? Only you. You're the only one. My wife doesn't call her friends and be like, hey, you'll never get, guess. Jonathan was right in the argument we had this day. That, that's never happened. You, you can do that if you want to. I'm just saying, but she, she's never done that. Is it worth being right? Is it worth feeling like you've done what you, when you know, just stop digging. Just stop digging. This morning, I, I'm, I'm, I tell you this because there's, there's a lot of times when I preach and I see things in the word of God and I see them for myself, not just for you. And this morning, I, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Stop digging. There, there's another way. That we don't have to dig our heels in and be right. We can swallow our pride. We can apologize. We don't have to go to war for things that don't matter. But that's not what God's, God's less concerned about you being right about everything and more concerned about you being righteous and being Christ-like. That, that, that's what God's interested in. When I read people arguing back and forth left on the left and on the right about political views, and they're arguing back and forth, and I want to be like, man, God's less interested in you arguing. He's more interested about you loving each other. So when I just choose to love someone who is different from me or thinks different than me, when I just choose to love them, that's what God's called me to do. That's, that's what God wants me to do, to be less right. And more like Christ.